Hi folks, this is Paul Isley, Mr. Talanzia. Welcome to episode five. We have some questions here, very good questions. The first one is from Debbie. And Debbie wants to know, how important is humidity? And what plants need a lot of it or only a little? Excellent question, Debbie. Humidity allows the plants to not need to be watered as frequently. It doesn't really make a difference in terms of how the plants grow, but when the humidity is low, the plants need to be watered more frequently, just like people. Water transpires, it evaporates out of people, out of plants, out of animals, out of everything, more when it's hot or when the humidity is low. So if you have a humid environment, it doesn't evaporate as quickly, and so you don't need to water quite as often. And as far as which plants like more humidity, the greener, softer leaf plants are more tender. So they appreciate more humidity. If you have extremely low humidity, like in Colorado or Arizona, it helps a lot to have some water around the plants. That water evaporates, it helps to raise the humidity, cut the edge off the dryness, and uh, you grow better plants that way, it's, more, it's easier. That's question number one. Number two is from Luke. Luke wants to know, I have a Talanzi called Moonlight, and it flowered and was pollinated. It's been nearly a year, but nothing has come out of the plump pods. What should I do? Nothing. Luke, if it's pollinated and you have the seed pods, they will open in due course. Some species can take up to two years before the seed pods open. So you just have to be patient, wait until they turn brown, they'll pop open, then you can take the seeds and sow them. So good luck with that. I have no idea what moonlight is, but it sounds like a nice plant. Number three is from Dorian. And Dorian says, I could be wrong, but I believe there are certain fragrant Talanzias that bloom only at night and smell. Firstly, am I correct in this? And secondly, what? why would that be? Well, that's a good question also, and I'm not a super expert on this. I have to qualify that. But there are Talanzias that have a slight fragrant that do bloom at night. They have white flowers. Um, Narthocoides is one, and there's another one I can't quite um, can't quite remember the name of it. It's back in the 70s when we had this one. But they do have slight fragrance. Their flowers are white. They bloom at night. And they're moth and, and butterfly pollinated. And maybe there are moths. There must be moths that fly around at night. There are also bromeliads that bloom at night with big white flowers. And they have a fragrance. And those are bat pollinated. They grow on the sides of cliffs. So that's pretty cool. Okay, the next question is, well, let's see here. This is from Instagram, and can you give me some tips on how to hybridize Talanzias or how you make hybrids? Well, a hybrid by definition is a cross between two different species. There are six or so subgenera in Talanzia that are separated by the way the flowers, the way they look, the way they are. Uh, some are pollinated by hummingbirds, some are pollinated by moths and butterflies. And different groups have evolved different floral structures to appeal to the different uh, pollinators. And so if you want to create a hybrid, you must work with species in the same subgenus. And you need to take the pollen from the one and put it onto the stigma of the other. Pollen grains are usually yellow, the stigma is usually white. Pollen is the male side of the equation and the stigma is the female side of the equation. So when the female stigma is receptive, that's when you would put the pollen grains on, you would get the seed pods developing over time, and like Luke was saying, then you can sow those seeds when the seed pods open. So then there is a picture here, 
of a Talanzia that, uh, oh, that Dorian or Luke wants identified. I'm not sure which person it is, but this is the picture of the, of the plant. And it's not an easy one to, uh, to tell exactly what it is. If I had to guess, I would say that it's an Aranthos miniata. Aranthos because of the shape and width of the leaves, miniata because of the shortness of the leaves and the compactness of the plant itself. That would be my guess. And the next question, this is from Sergio. I'd like to know if there is a gray Tillandsia that absolutely does not like to be exposed to sunlight, even if it is only part of the day or early in the morning, and that they prefer half shade or full shade. Most all the Tillandsias that are gray will do fine in, in partial shade, and most of them will do fine with some full sun. It's the gray. The gray is due to the trichomes, the white fuzz on the leaves that reflects up to 70% of the light that impinges, that hits upon the leaf. So most of them will take some full sun and most of them will do fine in shadier conditions. However, the darker it is, the less quickly they will grow. And if it's too dark, the plant isn't getting enough sunlight to photosynthesize sufficiently to maintain itself and gradually the plant will use up its starch reserves and fade away. Which is why when you have it inside the house and it's not getting a lot of light, it's fine for a month, but eventually put them in a brightly lit area or put a broad spectrum fluorescent fixture a foot over the plants and then they get plenty of light. Next question. This is from Instagram. How can Tillandsias be grown in such vast quantities when they take so darn long to grow? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> and we just, you know, you get numbers and, um, and you just do your best. You know, I mean, it's hard, you're right. It isn't easy, but um, the problem is that the plants have to compete. Those plants that we grow have to compete with plants collected out of nature. And the ones collected out of nature are dirt cheap. It doesn't cost anything to pull them out of the trees. And that's the foundation of the world trade in these plants. So, you know, you have to be able to compete with that, at least with some of them. Many others that we grow are unique and nobody has them, and they reflect more of the value of what it takes to actually grow them for many years. So, that's that one. And here's another question. I got a Tillandsia from Secunda from you guys a few months ago and read that it can root into the substrate. So my question is, the Tillandsia has no roots, so how do I hold it down onto the soil? And that's, that's another great question. So what you can do when it doesn't have roots and you want it to root, it needs to be on a fast draining medium and you can set it on there you do not want to bury it very much because when the base gets wet, the lower leaves will rot and maybe even the plant itself. So you just kind of sit it there and just take some sticks and just put them down into the soil around it and that will hold it in position until it does root. And that leads to another question which was and is, do the plants, when they develop a root system, uptake any nutrients or moisture? And the answer to that is yes, they do. If, and therefore you can grow a larger plant faster if you have it in a fast draining media and the, and the roots grow down in there and you get a substantial root system going, yes, you do get uptake of moisture and nutrients and uh, the plant, you can grow plants much larger, much faster. So that's, uh, I think that's it for the questions for uh, episode number five today, everybody. Um, I've got a really cool clump of uh, Tillandsia mostly Tillandsia caput medusa here and this is a special clone the leaves are, are just so velvety uh, so soft and velvety with the trichomes uh, you can see there I know there's several of them on there and then there's other plants as well strictas and um, these two guys look like hybrids okay I, I don't really know what they are but uh, they've been all, all been on there for several years and they're, they're just gorgeous they've rooted on all around the branches and they look really cool. And this is a beautiful Latifolia uh, Delgado, or De 
Devaricata. Um, the tag says Devaricata, so maybe that's what it is. You can see how tall the inflorescence is here. And this is so the hummingbirds can pollinate it easily because it's, you know, high up in the air. And this one does not produce offsets on the inflorescence. Many of them do. That's viviparous. The term, the botanical term is viviparous. When you produce an offset at the top of the inflorescence. And a number of latifolias do that. Uh, this one does not. So, there are some plants and some discussion. So, visit our nursery at www.rainforestflora.com. And we welcome your questions. And we will answer as many as we possibly can. And have a wonderful rest of your life. Bye. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that we have a new edition of our Talansia booklet, completely redone. This is the cover of it. You can see it's a picture of a uh, lucky lady. And if you want to learn about Talansia, there's a lot more than I could say in an hour. This is the way to do it. Plus, there's a lot of really pretty pictures. That's Talansia Marvelous Masterpiece. This is an almost 50-year-old clump of Talansia funkiana that's blooming. Here it says exactly what are Talansia air plants. And then it goes on to discuss the plants, what they are, how they grow, how to mount them, how to take care of them indoors, how to take care of them outdoors. Nice bloom of uh, Talansia aranthos. 32 pages. Talansia geminiflora. This is a picture of the retail nursery here in Torrance. Talansia winter circle, one of my favorites. Hybrid of Houston and Aranthos. Everybody loves this one. This is Talansia tenuifolia blue flower. A friend of ours grew this clump in about 10 years from one plant. And it's kind of a funny sidebar story. I shouldn't probably say it, but I will. Um, so Scott brought this thing over here, and it was so unbelievable. I took pictures of it. And the very next day, there was a giant windstorm that followed a giant rainstorm. And his poor clump got disintegrated. So that was the end of it. But at least it's immortalized in picture now. These are some indoor photos. It talks about how to grow them indoors. Talansia casey, a hybrid of uh, Bulbosa and Bootsii. Talansia Houston Colossus. This talks about the Tilly Tacker, the Tilly Hanger. And at the end, it talks about Talansia too, which of course is the big book on Talansia. So this can be ordered on our website. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the price. It might be $650, it might be $699. Uh, it's not expensive for what it is, and uh, highly recommended by me because I wrote, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, how do you promote something that you did yourself, right? But uh, I put a lot of effort into this to try and make it as good as it can be. And also, very important, that you could read it and get it the first time through. So often you read something and you say, what are they trying to say? You know, so it, you need to go through it over and over again to make sure everything flows. So when you read it, it makes sense. So, see you next time, folks. Rainforest Flora Incorporated.